So the rule is like no rules here. <laughs> so um, Shivani, do you guys celebrate Christmas? Yeah, kind of. Can you hear me properly? Because I've got headphones yeah, in. Yeah, okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, kind of. We kind of do a bit of everything. <laughs> so like, it, it's just not felt like Christmas this year. Mm. I, I don't know if that's the same for everyone else. It just feels really kind of like boring. <laughs> and not a lot's going on. So yeah, we do celebrate, but not much has been going on. What about you guys? Josh? Me? Yeah, we, we definitely celebrate Christmas, but um, <laughs> I would agree with Shivani, actually. I mean, it, it just kind of came and went this year. Um, yeah. It, it didn't really feel like there was much uh, festivities, and I think perhaps with all the anxiety and further restrictions and things, people's mm. minds have been a wee bit more forward in time than focusing on the moment, so... Mm. It definitely felt like it just kind of came and went. Um, it was a very, very quick day. I didn't really get ready until about half 12. Um, my gran and granddad came over, so we didn't really have to rush. Mm. Um, but the day went really, really fast. Really, really mm. fast. Mm. There was nothing on TV this year. No Doctor Who. Nothing. nothing. <laughs> oh, so, so there's no Doctor Who? No, there was no Christmas special this year. No. Um, what about EastEnders? I think that was on. I don't, I don't really watch that. but um, I think I saw people tweeting about it. I mean, I saw this news like in 1986, like I think 23 million people tuned in for Christmas EastEnders. Wow. Surely it's not that interesting. So a third of the UK tuned in to watch EastEnders. No, there, but I mean, that was 1986, you know. Before... So the population was at the time. But also before... We have all those, you know, this news media and all kind of, you know, TV channels, 24-7 things. So like 1986, perhaps just one TV channel. <laughs> People didn't have much choice, you know. <laughs> I think it used to be a really big thing, though, like Christmas TV, like Christmas so, Day and Christmas Night TV, whereas I think certainly last year, obviously, because COVID, there weren't a lot of things that were ready to be broadcast on Christmas Day. Yeah. And like I'm sure they started rationing out a lot of the soaps because <laughs> they, they kind of ran out of episodes. So they had to like kind of shelf some and, and keep some in reserve to, to make them last longer. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like this year, I mean, the only thing that we found to watch was Spin the Wheel, Christmas Spin the Wheel. It was actually really good. What's um, that? It was, it's a... It's a kind of game show uh, Michael McIntyre was hosting this one I've never seen it before but we watched yeah. it on Christmas Day and it was absolutely superb um, mm. so they have like celebrities they come up through this podium into the centre of, of a wheel like a roulette wheel yeah. and various categories are on the wheel they spin the wheel and so on answer the questions but it was actually really funny David Williams was on it um, kind of made it with Greg <laughs> Wallace so it was good but yeah I feel like it's a bit of a bygone thing like Christmas Day Day TV, like yeah, not a lot. Films, really. Yeah, even then there weren't that many coming on. It was just like random, bizarre films that you'd probably yeah. never actually watch. Mm. It's just not felt like it, and the lead up wasn't there either. I think I don't know if that's just me because I've got exams like next week. Yeah, so I was I kind mean, of just I, not yeah, in the mood. I didn't finish until quite late, like by our uni calendar. I didn't finish quite yeah. late because of the school placement, so. Mm. I say late, I mean, the schools were a week after me, but still, it's late by our normal time. When did you um, finish? The 20... No, I'm a liar. 17th. 17th of December, so the week before. Okay. Yeah, yeah. it's quite late, actually. It is for, for, for yeah. like, a uni thing, mm. yeah. Because um, we normally finished, like, what, like, the first week in December, Abdullah? Is that when you stop teaching? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's normally about then. So, mm. do you know what I really miss about Scotland? The fact that our exams were before Christmas. <laughs> it's so irritating to have to study over Christmas. I've never felt this kind of pain before. <laughs> it's, it's just like because you're sat at home thinking you're on break, and then yeah, no, 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 not. those books are just in the corner haunting yeah. me. <laughs> I mean, for me, Christmas yeah. was good because I mean, there's no one in the house, so. I'm just in the empty house. And then I asked my colleague and friend, Omar, to join me. And he joined me. <laughs> and we drank white wine and watched this film called mm. Don't Look Up. <gasps> watch it. 
I haven't seen it yet. I'm yet to watch it, but Timothy yeah. Chalamet's in it. So yeah. <laughs> I've heard I've heard it's quite a self-aware kind of kind of film. I'm quite interested. I in mean, it. I you know, got there yet. We, we are quite a film buff, you know. So like we thought it's good. It's really good. And mm. It's very clever. It's um, quite a big cast, right? Leonardo DiCaprio. Very big cast. Big Jennifer thing. Lawrence. Yeah. Timothy Kate, Kate Blanchett. Yeah. Um, oh, Jonah. Jonah Hill. Jonah yeah. Hill, yeah. Meryl Streep. <laughs> yeah, the, I saw Meryl the Meryl Streep's in it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a they lot. They must have had a budget and a half. <laughs> it is Netflix, so. Oh, true, so. Yeah. Or, I mean, these are all friends and mates, you know, they just, like, phone each other, you know. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but yeah, Jonah and Leo were in Wolf of Wall Street, so yeah. yeah. But also, it's it's a theme, you know. You had to believe in the, this kind of theme as well. Mm. So it's it's a quite you know anti-Trump, anti you know the things going on around the world. So uh, it's it's a very political film, very political. One to watch. Yeah, uh, but also very clever film. Whoever wrote this, you no, know, this guy is clever and it kind of reminds me do you know like what's his name uh, oh. who who wrote the veep and the thick of it oh, oh. Yeah. Hey, um armando, armando yanuchi yeah okay i'm with you now um so it's, it's very clever very very clever so totally recommend i mean it's, it's good fun as well it's really yeah. fun it's really i saw good. lots and lots of people on like various social media things saying things about it but Mm. I, I for some reason I hadn't heard about it until I saw people saying things. So mm. Mm. I started I mean, like I, the first two minutes of it, and then I was like, "This is dedication because it's two and a half hours long." Oh, <laughs> so it's like <laughs> it's, it's it's quite a long film. And I I think I did not give any spoiler here. So no, no, no spoilers. No, no I want to watch it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll definitely watch it. Mm. Jonah Hill is one of the greatest actors in this planet. I, I I really like this guy. <laughs> well, what else has he been in? I mean, he was in quite a lot. He was in. Um, have you seen Moneyball? But like, he's very good in Moneyball. It's um, it's kind of like the precursor to um, like the rise of the. Wait a minute, no. Yeah, yeah. He gets it's Billy Bean. Yeah, so he gets offered to take the Red Sox. I'm sure. Um, the Boston yeah, Red Sox, yeah, yeah but yeah. Like Jonah Hill plays like this analyst guy, yeah, who basically like, devises this Moneyball formula to take over baseball. It's it's oh, a pretty, cool. pretty good film actually. I enjoy like, it. I don't know, like he's got this something special, really special, and and he fits in mm. in his character in this film. It's just unbelievably good. Very obviously very sinister. <laughs> mm. Is he the one that was in? Um... Is it is it super bad? Is he in super bad? Yeah, yeah, he's. Yeah. Or is it the other one? I, mean, I always get confused between him and Seth Rogen. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. Um, no, he's in. He's in. I, you're maybe thinking as well, Shivani. Twenty One Jump Street. He's in Twenty One Jump Street. Of course yeah. he is. That's yeah. That's the best Seth film. Not time. also in that. <laughs> Sorry. Is that is Seth Rogen not also in that? That's what I think. Yeah, I think maybe there's a film the... that they're both in together, which is why I always confuse. I know Channing them. Tatum's in Twenty One Jump Street yeah. with him, but I can't remember if Seth Rogen's in it. Mm. James Franco, that's who's in it. Oh, he's a bit questionable, isn't he? Yeah, yeah he's in trouble, big trouble, <laughs> big trouble. As he should. <laughs> yeah, it only shows, you know, like the power and the. And the money and mm. the access they have is unbelievable. Like James Frank actually, you know, made, managed someone to get sacked in the university because he's one of those guys, you know, he was doing master's program. He was even like enrolled for the PhD as well. Mm. And he was doing this English literature course in like, I think Columbia or New York University. Mm. And he fell out with the professor. And actually, the university actually sacked the professor, not. And, yeah. and the professor was so furious. And then he took the whole thing to the court. And obviously, you know, 
undisclosed you know settlement we don't know what really happened uh, but you can see the the payout mm -hmm. hope like james franco doesn't watch this podcast I mean, he, might, <laughs> he, might he, sues you. he might sue us as well like <laughs> But I mean, no, all, don't all, worry, I've got you all, covered. All, all, all I know, legal scholar over there. <laughs> like all responsibility belongs to me, so you know. <laughs> you, <laughs> me. <laughs> That's okay. So, I don't think we commented on. Um, I, I, I own these. Okay. So, I mean, no. <laughs> you should only sue me. <laughs> I, I pull out my defamation law books. <laughs> don't, yeah. I'm not doing that. Don't worry. So, I actually should worry. I'm not doing it. Save that for but, Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> So I think like Shivani will be our, you know, more or less regular guest, you know, just to make sure that, you know, legally we are okay. <laughs> just taking notes in the background. <laughs> like, yeah, you can't, can't say that. <laughs> um, but I mean, this can be good for Shivani as well, you know, it's like you can be a, like, you know, celebrity lawyer. Get a lot of money for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also a lot of hate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think also, I can take that. <laughs> I don't want to be the next Rob Kardashian. Oh my god. Uh, so like Kim Kim got something like you know Lodigy oh. with it. Yeah. She passed she passed the baby bar. She didn't actually she hasn't got a law degree. Okay, she, what, what, what she has done. Oh, she, she really annoys me. But it, good on her for trying. But um she she passed so in california you can take the law exam without actually going to law school so i think that's what it is but she's mm. taking the first step to to basically like a first year exam so mm. she passed that exam so now she has to hit the real bar course to qualify as a lawyer okay. but i think just in california i don't think she can practice anywhere else <laughs> But I think she retook it, was it three or four times? Yeah, I think I'd read oh. that. I, the number three rings a bell. Yeah. yeah. She retook it a lot. And people were like, I know it's a really hard thing to pass, but, but also law students do it every year. So I'm sure. Mm. Yeah, three rings a bell. It's not my it's not my expert subject, but I'm I'm fairly sure she, she did it like sorry, she gets a private tutor every <laughs> single day. I mean, you're not that like, you know underprivileged I, I i just hope you know these are not online test or online exam. yeah imagine <laughs> and your, your think... tutor is sitting beside you <laughs> yeah just be like just tick that one yeah press this button <laughs> also in america most exams aren't they multiple choice yeah Could like be. almost every exam is multiple choice yeah <laughs> not like our exams yeah do you think this is another potential libel i think we're okay <laughs> no i don't think we're liable for this <laughs> i'm still trying to find out we're, we're, we're trying to you know we, we are more or less skeptical about her you know yeah yeah she failed the exam three times in two years i mean she's been busy i mean no, yeah no I guess. Lots of people are saying that. I mean, why does she need it? She has got. This isn't where I thought we were going to be going today. Um, <laughs> yeah. She's got like, you know, $600 million. <laughs> She's got an empire. I don't know why she wants to be a lawyer as well, but good on her for trying. I guess it's because her dad was obviously a very famous yeah. lawyer. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Her dad was involved in OJ the OJ Simpson. Day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fun case. The documentaries about that. The one with what's his face, Ross from Friends. Yeah. The kind of drama mockumentary thing. That that was quite the, good. The people versus OJ. Is that yeah, what you called? That's that's yeah. it. Yeah, the people mm -hmm. versus OJ. Yeah. David, David is it David? I always get his name wrong. David, David Trimmer. Yeah. 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 David and it's got Cuba Gooding Jr. as well, hasn't it? As OJ. Is, does yeah, he, he play OJ? I'm pretty sure he does, yeah. Even though he's tiny. <laughs> Yeah, I'm and OJ is like infamously six foot six or something. <laughs> I'm sure he does play OJ. Yeah. Uh, hi, I relocated. Oh. <laughs> Change of seat. <laughs> Change of scenery. Yeah. Table now because my dad just left. <laughs> how is how is London? 
in terms of COVID, in terms of life, in terms of everything. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a kind of an epic center now. Yeah, it's dreadful. It's actually not that, I don't know how to explain it, but so me and my friend went to Sainsbury's this morning. This is just sort of, um, sort of confirming how ridiculous it is. I went to Sainsbury's this morning. There's a lady at the door telling people to put her masks on. And my friend genuinely forgot her mask. She was like, do you guys have a spare sort of like disposable one that I can use? Um, the lady's like, just remember it next time. And just like letting everyone through. So basically there's no sort of control down here. They don't care if you walk in without a mask, with a mask, if you're mm -hmm. social distancing. 90% um, of the population, that's an exaggeration, like about 50, don't believe in the vaccine yet. So they refuse to get the vaccine. Mm. Um, I just don't know if I can slot act. I shouldn't say this because the person I'm going to talk about will see it. So I'm not going to say it, but there are certain people who are very, very questionable in their beliefs. Um, and yeah, London just doesn't seem to care. I think mm. we've convinced ourselves that we're immune to it, mm. Mm. to everything. Mm. Um, and people just going about their lives as if nothing really matters. Mm. But yeah, it, it's not good. And I guess everything's just sort of shutting down as well at the same time. Mm. I, mean, I mean, that's that's one of the things, like, I mean, uh, themes I, I, I was planning to talk. I mean, and why? Why people have got this kind of, you know, like disrespect for you know things like something serious happening for for this planet um do you think the politicians are to blame at a certain degree or like fully because it looks like you know, they're not only lying but also lots of hypocrisy there as well so when the camera rolls they're mm. saying one thing doing one thing but mm. behind the scene they don't give a shit about you know anyone they they can laugh at us you know so i think people People found it really, really. Mm. I think that there's like... two things that that really bug me about it, and I think that in a longer sense, bug a lot of people. Maybe they don't voice it in the same way, but I, I think it bugs a lot of people. The first one is we were never prepared for something like this. Mm. That's that's the most important point for me. Is we were, you know, they did the studies before to check mm. our preparedness for such an event, mm. and um, well, those things found that we were not ready. And we never acted on those those words. We never did anything about it, really. And as a collective, as a UK, we weren't ready. And that's despite, I'm sure there were multiple documents or surveys carried out about our preparedness for such an event. And, and I mean, I guess to some extent, they were just kind of put to the side. They weren't important. There were other priorities, political mm. priorities, Brexit being the crown uh, of those. Um and I think the second thing is, yeah, absolutely. In recent weeks, the, yeah, the hypocrisy, you can say that way. Mm. Um, definitely, I think some people would go further than that. I think some people mm. would say it's a deliberate act to kind of flout the rules in such mm -hmm. a way. Um, and then the opposite is there's some people who might agree with them, you know, well, they were at work, you know, it was just a work meeting. Some people see that as an acceptable mm -hmm. excuse. I, I think that th the main thing that bugs me is the the lack of a, to some extent, a coherent and, and to some extent also a political strategy to get through mm -hmm. this because everything's dogged with politics here. Mm -hmm. Like the vaccine is a political thing because people mm -hmm. either agree with it or don't they'll get it or they don't mm. um th there's not much of it that's not political which is the which makes it really difficult because everything's been turned into this choice you know you have to get the vaccine or you don't you have a vaccine passport or you don't and mm. uh, the government's depriving your rights or they're not um everything seems very binary and um mm. Mm. I think that just irks people more because in the UK, we're so used to binary politics. So it makes a lot of sense for people to have these kind of one dimensional views of the problem because, mm. you know, everything's yes or no, leave or remain mm. conservative or Labour. Of course, there are other parties, but that everything's so binary about our politics. And mm. yeah, I think people are just viewing the pandemic through like a kind of Brexit binary lens. Everything's just like, well, I'm not, you know, in favour of this or I am in favour of that. And it's like, well, you have to be on the side of health first and foremost and, and science because that's what informs everything in our life, you know. Medicine, 999 is who you call if you have a problem. You don't call 
Boris Johnson. You don't call fringe groups on social media. Well, some people do, I guess. But generally, you're going to call the emergency services. These are the people mm. who you want to help you in those times of need. So, mm. And yet they're the ones that are being attacked in some cases, if not harassed at the very least. Um, it's mm. quite disturbing. It's quite disturbing. Mm. With, when you combine it with Brexit and the kind of general slide to the right in the UK since, well, mm. a long time. Um, definitely post-2010, it's been a, a good a good shift to the right across, well, mainly England, but I guess also to some extent the UK as a whole. Um, it's quite disturbing to be a young person at this point, I think. It doesn't mm. help. My moment of the year. My moment mm. of the year will be, you know, when like Boris Johnson's, this like, I think, chief, chief of staff, um, what's the name? Allegra Stratton. Yeah. yeah. Allegra. I mean, oh, don't say I, it's that I, video. I mean, that's that's just like I mean, unbelievable. it felt like something out of Black Mirror. Okay, maybe, right. maybe Charlie Brooker's on the government's payroll now. You know what? I, I genuinely, <laughs> when I saw that for the first time, mm. it did feel like a mockumentary almost. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And you know yeah. when they cut forward and then it goes all like fuzzy. I was like, yeah. how, where is it? Mm. Where's yeah. that scene? Because it's ridiculous how sort of aware she was of everything oh, yeah. that was going on. And that's why I mean the difference where I think some people mm. say hypocrisy, some people say deliberate flouting of the rules. When you hear mm. her speak and you think, you know damn well fight what you've done and what you're doing. Yeah. So you can't kind of feign a, a, a ignorance or anything. You innocence. can't be like, oh, it was just a simple, you know, she's literally laying yeah. it out in front of you saying, oh, it was socially distanced. Like she's taking yeah. the mick of it, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but also I think that's that's what the problem is with the general public mm. is it's sort of like a parent-child situation where if you see mm. your parents disobeying the rules, yeah, you don't. That's follow. what you're going to do. Yeah, so mm. you see your parent Boris Johnson on the train, not wearing a mask, sort of you know, mm. having a massive party with his mates. You're going to do the exact same thing because if he can do it, why can't I? Mm. And I think that's what the issue is now is that people are just so sort of um they've closed their minds off to it they're like well everyone else is doing it so why should i be the one to care about everyone else when yeah. no one else does i think that's the main thing now is it's the apathy towards yeah it. it's like a general yeah. level of apathy that exists in well i can't speak for the whole uk i don't survey it regularly but it, it, it kind of feels that way consistently across different parts mm -hmm. of the uk and you know when you speak to people you know or, or even people online who you don't there does there does seem to be this kind of like general apathy, which is understandable. I mean, no one really, mm. of course, also the politicians don't want this either. People seem some people seem neglectful of that fact, but no one wants this. I don't believe no one wants this situation, but it's here, um, mm. and it's about how we deal with it and how we have dealt with it so far. And mm. you know, to some extent, we have done a good job. You know, the fact that people, I mean, I have three vaccines in me. You know, that to say that. <laughs> Is quite frightening because there's some people who still don't have one, yeah. um, and not just in this country, but in countries around the world who, you know, perhaps should have had their first before I had my third, for example. But we are where we are. Mm. Um, but that it's a huge achievement. It's a huge achievement that we've been able to deploy those vaccines and actually get them to people in such a quick way, and meanwhile ensuring that they're able to be used effectively um, mm. and safely. So it's a huge mm. thing. I really want to talk a bit more on this because I mean it, this is such an iconic moment you know in the mm -hmm. 21st century's politics. And... I don't know if I'd say iconic. <laughs> <laughs> no, like I mean in a like bad way. You know? Cataclysmic. <laughs> Cataclysmic. <laughs> um, I mean, I did you remember like I, I I used to mention in my politics class about something called Athenian problem. So this mm -hmm. is like classic Athenian problem. So like you have got democracy but also you are an empire, you behave like an empire. So that mm -hmm. means, I mean, you have to do bad stuff. And also, mm -hmm. you know, but at the same, same time, at the end of the day, you have to convince your public as well that you know, you're bad, but you know, the people should accept you. Mm -hmm. So if you see her, this, you know, the whole two, three days event, I mean, so she was doing that thing and, and then she came up in the, in the media again, and then she was crying. Hmm. She was crying that, you know, how, you know, sorry she is, and this, you know. so it's like you know, classic Athenian problem. She 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 wants to, she wanted to convince the public that you know, yeah, uh, you know, so it's bad, but you know, I'm now crying, so you know, so please. I still that. care, like 
I'm yeah, not here. Really, I'm still yeah. not here. But I think the problem with the Athenian problem is, I mean, once you are exposed, I think that's really difficult yeah. to yeah, you're right. Yeah, retract. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the things like happen afterwards, like you know, mm. all those right wing newspapers, like the Spectators and the Daily Mail, and all those people, you know, kind of defending her. <laughs> and so there's a serious blind spot about you know even understanding of democracy how it works. You know? Yeah, I, it, on sorry. you. Sorry, no, no, no. Go, go, go. Sorry, yeah. I was just going to say, I think it's just ridiculous because I saw somebody else compare it to the Diana Abbott situation a couple of years ago, where she cracked open a tinny mm-hmm. on the train and the whole country went crazy. They're like, how dare she disobey the law like this in a position of power? And then suddenly this has come about and there's nothing. So a, a couple of people, a few people kicked off, but the news didn't kick off about it. You know, no. the media didn't kick off about it, but you know, an actual mm. proper violation of the law, and you're just sort of like, oh, it's yeah, it's fine. You know, it but was like kind of the, the female theme. It's quite interesting that you know there was this view as well that Allegra was kind of fed to the wolves to to keep with her uh, crocodile tears. <laughs> yeah, to keep yeah fed to the wolves of the crocodile tears to keep the king in his place. You know, it did feel a mm. bit kind of throw her under the bus and and keep everyone else in control and you know it's her that did it and you know she didn't organize attend and be the sole attendee at this event or these no, events no there was no. multiple parties and in fact yeah the whole the whole investigation full investigation process like simon case had to be removed because there was a party that i think he attended or was in <laughs> his vicinity. so they had to say like sorry i can't do this anymore because you know i have a I was part party to the party at some point. Um, it's just it's it's just it smacks a sleaze, and you know, it, it seems to be a consistent theme um, yeah. that these sorts of things have been going on at various parts of, you know, that they're saying kind of Christmas parties. But then there's there's these images about like garden things that mm. have gone on, mm. and yeah, you know, I think Dominic Cummings has been kind of feeding some info yeah. as yeah. well. So there was the young Tories. Uh, I don't know if you saw that. There oh like yeah, 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 yeah. Office yeah. party all yeah. happened at the same time. You I, know, just, like, I have a degree of sympathy. Like I, I do have a degree of sympathy. I don't know if you remember, like the 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 old chief medical officer in Scotland, Catherine Calderwood. She, yeah. she had to resign because she went to a holiday home in Fife. I believe it was Fife, which breached the travel restrictions mm. and she obviously she was you know sorry you have to go now um and you just think like i'm not it's hard to kind of make an equivalence but like part a versus home you know albeit a second home but it's just kind of you, you i personally felt more more people should have owned up and said look this shouldn't have happened let's get a bit of respect back a bit of trust back and and let's do the honorable thing and and step aside Instead of denying it blatantly yeah well denying. that was the best part they denied it and then like the videos started flowing and then the tears started flowing and you just feel like come on like, like, there's literal we politics here we have to find everything out by like journalists and then we just we just kind of move on <laughs> but it was the way that dominic cummings was used as almost like a scapegoat initially when he yeah, traveled to the, the castle leg, right? yeah it's the same thing yeah only and all the blame is just off the actual far more convoluted story <laughs> yeah. than I. I mean, that was another iconic moment. <laughs> that was that one was genuinely iconic. That was that was quite something. So, he like he was wearing this like white shirt, you know? Yeah. And was, like, I remember watching that. That was trending for like almost like three four hours. That you know. That was quite a moment, I have to say. <laughs> that, when he was sat, it was like the rose garden, wasn't it? And. Yeah, I just remember yeah. seeing this Rose big Garden, table, yeah. and then he was late. He was so late. He was so so late, and then he eventually turned up and did his speech. <laughs> and you just kind of thought, like everything about this has felt, like Giovanni said, so Black Mirror esque. Everything about I mean, it, so like, Black Mirror esque. It's just, it's frighteningly I, believable. Mm. I also think that's why the public have like completely disassociated from it as well yeah. because it doesn't feel real. Yeah, I think this is so she's like, a good way to put it. Yeah. It doesn't so feel much it. of the stuff that's been going on just doesn't feel like it's an actual sort of thing happening. Yeah. It just feels like you're in a TV show and that you're gonna wake up in about two months and be like, actually, I think as well, that, that there, was there's, just- there's, a, there's a point you can make about that because in the UK, I mean, despite some 
you know, like weather related crisis and, and concentrated issues in particular regions, we tend, we're a very stable country generally. Yeah. We don't face these kind of big things, you know. So, like when you couple the lack of preparedness with a lack of, I mean, people still like Boris's first reaction to this was to, to go back to World War II and to use the war imagery. You know, that was our last huge thing of this sort of scale, 1940s, you know, 1939 to 1945. Of course, there have been other things since, like some people would say Falklands or whatever, but nothing of that. Sure, I don't know if you can hear the crisis outside. Apparently, every ambulance in London's been deployed no, from no. their station. Can't hear anything. Okay, that's fine then. But, um, no, it's uh, it's just I, it's, it's it's bizarre, isn't it? It does. It feels mm. so surreal, but then also very real in some moments. Like I think when when it first started back in March, when we saw all the the TV broadcasts, like it, it did actually feel real. It felt like this was a a very much alive yeah. thing that was here. Mm. Um, and mm. then I think once like this kind of stage we're at now, it, it just doesn't feel real anymore. It just kind of feels yeah. like mm. something's there, a general anxiety, but there doesn't seem to be much punch. Mm. That's quite interesting because I mean, this is the first time you know, I saw like, you know, Boris Johnson, you know, this kind of his polls are getting down and down. Um, because I mean, it looks like, you know, the UK population i mean they they are okay with the lies but not with the hypocrisy so yeah. so um well, we know they're like, okay with lies because uh the majority of them voted for something that they now probably would, would vote against so we know we know mm. that the lies are okay um but mm. the hypocrisy yeah people don't like to see it they don't mind hearing things i think but seeing things mm, no too much because when it when it directly affects them, they're like, "Oh crap, it's actually mm. going to happen to us now." Mm. Mm. And context matters. We've all been to some, or most of us have been locked up at various points mm. throughout the last two years. And yeah, you know, I think especially for like some younger people, I, I don't feel the same way. But some people kind of feel like, "Oh, we're being deprived of our prime years." Yeah, um, which is is true to an extent. Um, you know, and I think when you when you kind of have that feeling of like deprivation or loss. And then you look at what you see on the TV, the crocodile tears and the stories that you read, and you just kind of feel like, well, why? Why am I feeling this way when they're fine to have their cheese and wine nights and days and yeah. mm. afternoons and parties? And mm. why shouldn't we do something similar? I mean, I would love to have those kind of, you know, office setting, you know, like <laughs> wine, cheese, you know. You can sit in the garden, you know, you can, it almost, you know... <laughs> sounded like you know a big fan working for the 10 down industry i think it's just like i mean i've never been prime minister of course but i think if you're in that job you have to accept a degree of like honor and, and respect and trust and you know i just i i don't know boris johnson personally but it seems like he lacks a lot of these things and i think he likes the idea of being prime minister i think you know the idea of being the pm and all that comes with that fantastic but the actual day-to-day -day job I, I don't know, maybe it's not, he's not quite cut out for it anymore. Mm. Do you know what I think he thinks he's doing? You know, as a kid, when you have those little shop tills and you <laughs> running play. your own shop, I think he genuinely thinks that's what he's doing with the country, <laughs> is that he he thinks he's got this country to play with. Yeah. Let me see what I can do today, kind yeah. of thing. We, we could like legally get in trouble for this, but who cares? But, you know, <laughs> it's just, mm. I think he genuinely takes it as a joke and he's like oh if i can help my mates along the way it's great but you know mm. who actually mm. cares what happens to the rest of the country mm. i've got what i wanted which was my dream of becoming prime minister for a little bit do you think he will survive his term no yes <laughs> i think he will i think he will i think for me, it's, there's a, I, I feel to some extent there's there's perhaps a similar situation in the other like nations of the UK, but I feel like there's there's perhaps some people waiting in the wings or people who would like to be you know prime minister or first minister or whatever. But I still think while COVID's here and you know we saw with Omicron how quickly things can change. I mean, mm. like rewind a month, we knew about it, but there was not really much in the way of serious talk or even serious mm. restrictions. Fast forward a month and, you know, things are closing again. Um, I, I I just feel like when you've got something like that, until they feel like they're out of the woods, I don't think anything will actually happen. I think I think he's mm. I think he's relatively safe. How mm. long has he got left? Three years? 
The election was 2019, was it? Yeah, 2019. Yeah, it's another two years. 2019. Wow. Yeah, it was just before COVID. Yeah, so it was. Yeah, yeah, of course, because it was before Brexit uh, in yeah January. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was. Mm-hmm. It was December, mm-hmm. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it was December. It was it Christmas was alike. It wasn't obviously Christmas Day, but it was Christmas kind of themed election. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah, 2019. Wow. I, I, I think you'll make it. There's my claim. I think if it keeps, <laughs> if anything else comes out, I, I have, or which, which it will, will. <laughs> which it definitely will. I genuinely don't think he can make it. I think the only thing that could probably derail him further is, yeah, if there was something major that came out. I, I, I still, I don't really think another cheese and wine night picture is going to do it personally. No. Something drastic has to happen. Uh, or mm. if, like the growing kind of group of backbenchers yeah. uh, who are fighting against like the government's COVID restrictions and whatnot, if they get more uh, voluminous and, and whatnot, then perhaps, perhaps they might force something through. Um, but obviously they need to convince a majority within his own party, which, mm. I mean, they would know that's probably electoral... I don't want to say the S word, but you know the word I would use. Mm-hmm. Um, it's probably electoral for them, I think, if they were to vote out their own man, mm-hmm. especially against this mm-hmm. kind of national feeling of mm-hmm. lack of control and this kind of yeah. rudderless ship at the minute in the UK. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I can't see it. I can't see mm-hmm. it. I think he'll make it to the next election. Like one of those like moments, like David Frost, he's like one of those you know, Brexit guys. Yeah. Mm. And if you if you follow him or like you know Dominic Cummings, it's like Dominic Cummings. You know he was really angry with like Boris Johnson and and his like friends. But but mm. he he had full respect for this guy David Frost. This is the guy. You know is is he's good. You know he's he's faithful to his you know this like journey Brexit journey. Mm. And now he's out. He's basically saying that you know what we actually plan through Brexit, you know, like low tax, you know, entrepreneurial, you know, kind of business model, <laughs> like the Singapore model. I don't know, like Singapore has got lots of bureaucracy. <laughs> um, There's so many things that really trouble me with Brexit. Um, I think, though, that the, the main thing is that those who campaign for Brexit, I feel, have a huge responsibility and debt to those and and particularly the deprived communities who were convinced to vote for it. Um, I think they have a huge responsibility for these communities, a huge responsibility. Um, And obviously that now kind of extends to the Conservative Party because of the fact that so many of these former kind of Labour heartlands in the North Mm -hmm. are Tory held seats, but not all, of course, but there's a few. Um, They need to deliver. They need to deliver for those communities. but then also there's an argument people made their choice. So they have to mm, look at it. Mm. But yeah, I, I I think that's one of the main things for with Brexit for me is those communities that did vote for it. Mm. The people now have to deliver for them, but mm. they also need to deliver for the whole UK. For me, like with this David Frost thing, I mean, I think he thought that Boris Johnson is going through lots of things, you know, lots of personal scandals, you know, lots of footages coming out. So, you know, he was thinking that, oh, this guy actually cannot deliver the thing. So we need something, something else. So I think that was his, perhaps like he was really committed in that, into that kind of thing. But the problem is, I mean, there's not much alternative in the, like, the current political setting. Uh, you have to deal with these people, like, you know, like people like, you know, Dominic Raab, Trust, Pretty Patel, you know, these are the people, you know, more or less, you know, long history of lots of bad things. There, there, there's so many people in that party who have aspirations, either directly said or, or evidenced or otherwise or, or, or indirectly to be prime minister. It's quite, I think, well known. Like Liz mm-hmm. trusted her Christmas card thing that looked very, you know, hi, I'm in the future prime minister world. Um Dom Rab also he you know, he stood in the you know leadership race. Um, yeah. Michael Gove's just like this guy that never goes away. He's always, always, always in the frame when it comes to these discussions. Um, he is COVID. 
there's so many there's so so many i think that's the thing as well like when you combine like the kind of perceived sleaziness and then this the trust and then there's all these people around boris that are waiting rishi sunak is another one who was kind of touted at various points because of the the pandemic response furlough scheme blah 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 mm. um there's so many there are so 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 many people whereas i think when you go to other political parties or even I think in Scotland, there are not a lot of people. There's maybe like a couple, but I think with the Conservative Party, it's like who doesn't want to do it, you know? Everyone. Or who, who, or who hasn't declared that they want to do it? I think that's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. Like his cabinet, I think, is probably filled with people who either have stood to be a Conservative Party leader or before were previous party leaders. Uh, you know, it's a very weird, and I, I think probably I'd imagine it to be quite a dysfunctional relationship at points. Mm -hmm. mm. This is the people like, you know, used to hate Boris Johnson, you know, now they are working under him and then... Uh, the I just think he's their fall guy now with COVID. Crazy. That's why I don't think he's going anywhere. I just think he, like, mm -hmm. his reputation's gone. It's been gone since yeah. he took office. Like, it, it, it's not been a brilliant thing ever. I don't know if um, it was there before COVID, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, I just kind of feel like I don't think they'll get rid of them until they are very, very confident that this pandemic's on its last mm. legs for me. Mm. The problem with, you know, Tory party is, I mean, they've got some ideological things. I mean, they, mm. you know, they're supposed to deliver those things like low tax, you know, like you know small state and all those things but you know during the pandemic and the post pandemic scenario these are the things will be extremely difficult to deliver well yeah i think it's it's ironic as well because for so long like when i was growing up the conservative party had this moniker being the party of business <laughs> and um you know at various points in this pandemic i don't think that's been shown to be very true um uh, and and with Brexit as well, I mean, what responsible government would advocate or, or its key campaigners who later would become prime minister uh, would advocate for a position that would make and has shown to make businesses across the UK materially mm. worse off? So I think that's beginning to slide a bit, like this kind of idea that they're the party of business. And, you know, arguably that's perhaps why Corb uh, Corbyn... Uh, Starmer's pitched himself kind of more in the middle because mm. there's so many of those old cliche things that he could, I, I'm presuming he wants to sweep up, like kind of Blair style, you know, sit yeah. on the middle and you'll pick up the most of the votes. And mm. yeah, that's mm. that's kind of where I'm at with it. More. Shivani is like more like lever activist, I mean. <laughs> um, yeah, like what... I can't declare that anymore, but yeah. <laughs> so what's your take, like... Do you think this is the moment? I think that the issue here is that with it's like what Josh said that they've the Tory Party have used Boris Johnson as this perfect little take all the hits kind of thing, mm. but then also Labour still weak as it ever has been. They've not they've not developed anything properly or any sort of stance that they can actually they can actually compete with the Tories because they're still in themselves completely divided. Mm. Keir Starmer, I think, is a very weak leader and he's not, you know, he's not got the same charisma. I mean, I think the last person that did was Ed Miliband, actually, mm. that kind of had the, the sort of funny charm that kind of Boris Johnson has to get, yeah. get people because that's, the, that's the, the way politics works, I think, for mm. normal people that don't understand it, mm. is they look at the face of it and they're like, well, this guy, you know, he looks like he can run the country. This guy doesn't. And mm. I just don't think Labour has that right now. Mm. So even if they do have the policies and they do have the correct motives, they don't have what the people the people want, which mm. is sort of an ideal kind of package with a nice ribbon on it to say, here's your perfect prime minister. So I think it's all about playing to the public as well, rather than your actual policies at the moment, mm. is that people want that kind of strong leader. Because I think that's what's happening with America as well, is that mm -hmm. Joe Biden, no matter what he does, he's seen as this weak sort of little fragile leader now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, and it's made America almost this kind of weaker country in itself just because of the way that Biden's presented himself. Mm -hmm. 
And I think if Labour were to do the same thing, that's what we're going to look like, is that we've got this weak little leader, which is what people were afraid with with Ed Miliband. Mm, But now I think it's it's going to be the same thing. So until then, we are going to be stuck with, unfortunately, people in the Tory party because they do have that personable approach to people, Mm. which the party that can, you know, take on the Conservatives doesn't have. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's sort of like yeah, yeah, yeah. What I think I main, I don't think it's anything to do with the policies right now because mm. people are just so fed up with it. Mm. They just I want think, someone at face value who can. I, say, I think I'm going to be a prime minister. I think that's the bigger problem, though. It's it's the apathy with with mm. that's, that that has been caused by and also um, sustained by the pandemic. I think already before there was a wee bit of like disengagement, of course, but. As much as Corbyn got a lot of heat and and some of it very much rightly so, um, one thing he did do was get people engaged. Um, yeah. And and I feel like that's something that maybe if Starmer had have come before Corbyn, we might be in a different position. There's perhaps a bold claim. I don't know, but I feel like yeah. you can't have someone who's so left that you know, and then go to someone who's more in the center of of the line, and then expect more engagement and. When he first came, I actually said I thought he'll be the next prime minister mm. after yeah. after Boris, and I still I still think that he will. I I I know he's not yeah. he was the best, mm. but I still think mm. he will. Um, mm. who knows? He could be deposed as leader tomorrow. But I think he's also not very um, he's not very assertive with his opinions and his views. Yeah, Whereas I think that's what Corbyn had, which, which was is amazing. ironic because of his job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just think that that's what Corbyn had, but people didn't like the way he did it because yeah, he was so didn't left. like what he was saying. <laughs> yeah, but he was so sort of like, this is what I believe in and this is what I'm going to stand by. Whereas mm. I think the, the issue that people who supported Labour before now have with Keir Starmer is that you're not standing up for any of the values. Mm. Like even if Blair was centre, sort of centre left, he still had, he still stuck that's by his values. Right. And you had the personality um, to win. Yeah, to win the and he was a so, charmer. So it didn't matter. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With me, like, you know, like, I mean, he, he's not a bad politician. He seems like, you know, he has got lots of packages. You know, he's, he's, he's well-educated, you know. Yeah. Um, he has got good sense of, you know, honor, you know, dignity and all those things. I think the problem is like he's like with me like he's he almost is like Malcolm in the middle. You no, know? he he's yeah. like he he cannot be like Tony Blair because Tony Blair more or less gone because no things happened, and also like this Jeremy Corbyn. So like these two things, and um, mm-hmm. and he could not be neither, and and then so he, he I think he's struggling to find his own yeah. ground. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would have been fascinating to see Starmer's labour and his style in that mm-hmm. election against Theresa May. I think yeah. that, that would have been fascinating because I think the public would have went very possibly narrow, narrow labour win. Uh, mm-hmm. I just I just think that this is the problem. Like when when he's competing, he's he's against a man who is known to be um his persona. Yeah, and and I think that that's something that, I mean, I I, I personally am a, a a bit of a fan. I think he is a very good politician. I would agree, but that kind of personality aspect, I think, needs a lot mm-hmm. more work. I think his his ability to dissect arguments, of course, is good because he's a lawyer, right? He's yeah. this is what you would expect yeah. him to be good at. Like I've seen him in PMQs a couple of times, and I you know I thought you are pretty yeah. good. But I have to remember, I'm someone with a politics degree. We are all people with degrees, you know, and and I think that sometimes it just doesn't quite cut across in the way that people would, would perhaps maybe slightly less knowledge about politics mm-hmm. or less interest yeah. in their need. Mm-hmm. They need someone mm-hmm. bold and, and very big personality. And yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I agree with you there. Cause I'm like, it's, it's the fact that he is a good politician and a good leader to mm-hmm. people who know politics and how it works and policies, yeah. but not to people who just want to tick a box and be out of the hall. Mm-hmm. Or, and he's also yeah. fighting a party who've shown a lot of disregard for the rules of the game. So yeah. he has to kind of, I think he has to show a bit of an edge at times where... He has to take those jabs where they're, they're, yeah. they're open, just take them. Yeah, like I think that's his only major criticism from me is he's almost too respectful yeah. of the rules of the game. And 
You That's know, what it is. He's not a politician. He's more of a lawyer. Yeah. There's a lot of anger out there. Try and control that and try and do something with it. You know, that's what I think the opposition's job is. Mm. Channel people's frustrations into a meaningful argument and ultimately convince more people that you're right and they're wrong, mm. which is something he seems half able to do. He seems to be able to show that arguments are wrong, but he doesn't be, seem to be able to get people to understand his way of thinking and get them on mm. side. Mm. So, but The problem is, I mean, obviously he has got this this like inherent personality, you know, which he has got this from his more or less very early age. Mm. So he just cannot change that kind of persona for this politics. It's, it's really difficult. You just cannot manufacture a new kind of persona suddenly to fit I, also, I feel like that's the thing about politics. So to be an actual politician, it is a bit of showmanship. Yeah. And you do need to be a bit like sort of eccentric and be able to... Yeah sort of present this excessive character even if it's not you yeah just to engage people into your sort of what you're saying otherwise mm-hmm. if you're just going to be stood there going so i think that we should offer free broadband to <laughs> kids like no one's going to listen to you I just, it's, mm-hmm. it's ironic because you would think in all the stuff we've said about trust respect institutions yeah exactly the man this country probably needs yeah you know in terms of those, those values that's what we need back in politics are those kind of values like kind of bringing things away from like polemical arguments, like trying to talk about reason, let's talk about actual policies. That stuff he tries to do all the time is bring it back to policies and try and kind of speak in this this respectful and trustful and an honest way, or, or at least on the surface of it, honest way. Um, and and it's, it's just not ringing true for a lot of people in this country still. So I, I also think that's quite concerning that we have someone who's speaking in this way trying to restore a bit of trust and honesty and I guess also a bit of dignity like the, the UK was kind of seen as this like respected democracy and you know like develop the German paper always puts all these cartoons you know and since a few years ago like started I think with Theresa May and with Boris it's gotten worse as well like these kind of yeah. really satirical cartoons um about our politics like it's gone we, we've slid down the scale i think we're we are a joke though that's yeah what it, yeah a and also brexit joke. and you know it's <laughs> the eu and yeah but also it's, it's a kind of time you know where we can see like this kind of you know caricature kind of figures like you know yeah that's world. exactly what it is so this is the time for these people no, so that's but it's like, ironic. The caricature for Theresa May was the part of her downfall, was her caricatureness. And it's the opposite for Boris. His caricatureness yeah. is his strength. Yeah. His, his kind of pally like persona is his strength. You know, that is that's a that's but that's a construct as well. It's not something that's him. I think it's also a very carefully crafted media persona, like this kind of bumbling idiot. I, I don't believe that's necessarily. I mean, the guy's very well educated, despite yeah. how he feels. <laughs> Oh yeah, um, and I just I don't believe for one second that that's natural Boris. I think that's this kind of crafted thing, and I think that's the sort. I'm not saying Starmer has to imitate that, but that's something he needs to find. 